sure you, you read that and encourage him um, as one of your peers. The sermon title this evening is Shame, the Great Motivator. And I wanted to title it that because I, there's all sorts of things we could talk about. And the last thing I want you guys to think is that I'm going to sit here and beat you up tonight. That is not the point of uh, my lesson and shame. And I'm hoping that I get to speak to you where you're at. As you know, our topic for this school year has been uh, all the feels. And if uh, you're over the age of 30 like I am and you had to be explained what all the feels meant, we're talking about emotions. And so, uh, and the meaning of emotions are uh, simply defined as feelings which can be caused by the situation that you are in or the people uh, that you are with put you in or that you are in together. And the last two times we gather, we gather, we covered love and fear, and this evening we are going to cover shame. Um, I want to give you a personal story. Uh, what is shame? Uh, I don't know if you know much about me. Uh, I ended up, I moved here from Michigan, and I graduated from Newcastle, Oklahoma. I went from a Grayling, Michigan to a school that had about 700 in my graduating class to Newcastle where there was 84 I was, the only, uh, I was the only kid in my school who showed up in yellow Reeboks and parachute pants, okay? Uh, everybody else was cowboy boots and jeans, and it was just kind of a weird place. I was, always felt kind of out of place there. And uh, Newcastle, they have uh, the, an FAA convention every year they used to um, and for ag, and the whole idea was, did I say FAA? I meant FFA, I think. There we go. All right, sorry. Anyways, uh, yeah, you can tell I'm way out of high school, can't you? All right, so, but this, uh, so we're, we're at this ag convention, and I'm 14. Uh, my sister's 18 months younger than me. She's, she's 12. She's going to turn 13 soon. And uh, at this Christmas convention, uh, they have this raffle. And you can get tickets, and they're free for kids who are uh, between, I think it was like 5 or 6 and, and 12, that was the cutoff, was 12 years old. And I'm 14, and they had this sweet prize. And it was, uh, uh, it was this big gift basket. And it had basketballs and air pumps and like some sleeves in it and things like that. And I, was, I really wanted that, but I was 14. And my grandma at the time watched us a lot. And my grandmother and I have a special relationship. She is, uh, she's one of the main people that I contribute to uh, being restored to Christ. Uh, so if you have a grandma behind you going, you need to work on this, listen to your grandma. She knows what's best, okay? Anyways, in this situation, my grandma said, Titus, I know you. You better not enter that raffle. But I wanted the basketball. My sister was going to enter. And the whole bucket was full. And I said, where are the odds? I'll throw my name in there. It'll be fun. Until they called my name. Yeah. And my grandma looked at me, and, and I can't describe the look other than if looks could kill. Um, but, like, literally, she was like, you better, boy. I'm going to get you, right? And I was very embarrassed. I was very shameful in that moment. However, the most shameful part was that they wouldn't let me not accept it. So at 14 years old, in front of all these people who are steaming mad at this misbehaving 14-year-old who's just embarrassed his grandmother... Now they all get to sit there and go, oh, no. And I'm standing there. Ask Liz Way. She knows what kind of troublemaker I was in school. All right? So this, uh, I said Liz Way. Man, Liz Scott, sorry. Anyway, so this, I, this idea that I, was, I had to sit there, and I was, I was embarrassed, and I had to take it. And people were embarrassed for me. They were embarrassed for my grandmother. Uh, it was just this whole, this whole thing was really embarrassing and I wonder if you've ever felt that way. Have you ever maybe done something you didn't think was a big deal and it ended up becoming a, a big deal? Or you did something that, that, uh, that became a bigger deal than you expected it to be, and you found yourself to be in the wrong? Um, I don't really have to get in the nitty-gritty. We all know what shame feels like, all right? I don't have to tell you. You've probably already felt it more than likely. And there are two types of shame that I believe you as teenagers, uh, we as everyone, but you as teenagers uh, feel specifically, and one of them is embarrassment. Uh, 
An embarrassment is a shame that you feel for yourself and for others. Um, I don't know about you, but this is the most cringy, shameful relationship in, uh, as, far as, as far as I know. Why is, oh, we got some guys over here. Yeah, that, this dude is hitting on this other dude's girlfriend. And every time it came on in the office, I was going, oh, ew, gross. I'm so embarrassed for Jim. That's, that's not good. I was embarrassed for him. Um, every time Roy comes in to see her, the audience cringes because of the situation, and that's embarrassment for others. And then there's something like this, where you're embarrassed because uh, perhaps you have fallen in front of everyone. And most people, especially teenagers, if you fall, uh, uh, especially if you're your youth minister on the basketball court at fall retreat and you fall for no reason, um, they laugh at you instead of help you up, right? That's, em that's embarrassing. Yeah, Luke's laughing. He saw it. I was just walking, and uh, my ankle hit the ground for some reason, and I was just on the floor. Uh, so I guess that comes with old age. But it was, I was embarrassed for myself. But then there's this shame that, that we all have felt before, the shame that makes us want to hide. And this is shame that comes from wrongdoing. And it's this feeling of guilt that comes from doing something wrong. When we feel this shame, we are usually given a choice between right and wrong, and we consciously choose to do wrong. And then we're caught, or, or the shame overwhelms us, and we want to run away and hide. Uh, in my case, with the, with the basketball gift, I felt both of those. Um, however, even if you want to run away and hide, you had grandma and the uh, club members standing there making sure that you, uh, you got what you deserved, so to speak. Um, and I'll never forget that. Do you think I've ever entered a raffle I'm not supposed to enter again? <laughs> I'm 35. This was like 20-something years ago, man. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in that anymore. So tonight, as we, we dive into shame, I just want to take a few minutes, uh, and you can pull out your papers, and I want to leave you with five things that, that you, right now, can, can know about shame, and I hope that it helps you with your walk. Uh, we'll start in Genesis chapter 2. Adam and Eve are living in a perfect place, all right? Number one, skipped right over it, see? Number one, shame is a result of sin. All right, that's the first thing that we're going to fill out. Shame is a result of sin. In Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve are living in a perfect place. What place is that? Garden of Eden, right? The only way to live and act there was within the confines of morality and God's nature. Shame was not a thing. In fact, in verse 25, it'll say, they were naked and unashamed. Shame was not a feeling that was there in the beginning. God did not create us with shame. And before they sinned, Adam and Eve were given four rules. Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue or bring control to the earth. Have dominion, which means rule over the creatures of the earth. And to eat all seed-bearing plants except that which come from the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. In chapter 3, verses 5, when tempting Eve with the fruit, the serpent doesn't just say that they're not going to die. What does he say? He says, uh, he just goes a little further, and he says that you're going to be like God. You're going to know good from evil. You're going to know right from wrong. And we all know the choice that they chose, right? They chose the latter. They chose not to obey the choice of which they felt was shame. They were embarrassed because they were naked, one of the first things, and they were ashamed that they had done wrong, and now they had to answer to God. And what did this shame, what, what action did this push them to? Well, they ended up being afraid, right? They heard God come, and they were afraid. They literally ran from him, tried to hide themselves from him. Man, I felt some shame that's made me want to hide. And I've been feeling it most of my life depending on the choices that I make. I'm sure that Eve felt shame in being deceived. I'm sure Adam felt shame as he blamed his wife when he was there and could have stopped it. I'm sure that the serpent, serpent may have felt some sort of shame, probably because he got caught. All right? And I bet they all felt shame as they lost the dwelling place to be among God. Understand having an emotion that makes us feel bad or guilty was not in God's original design for us. Shame has come 
as a direct product of sin. It is the product of straying away from the standards that God has placed for you and for me. And now we have this feeling that overcomes us when we know right from wrong and we choose to do wrong. That is shame. However, number two, in its proper place, shame is a great motivator. I truly believe that. And we'll be spending the rest of our time in Acts chapter 2. Am I a gospel preacher if we don't open Acts 2? All right. The Holy Spirit falls on the apostles and they are able to speak to all the people who gathered in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And they're doing it in their own language, right? And Peter reasons through scripture explaining how they were responsible for Jesus' death. And the accused hear and they believe that they made a huge mistake and they were cut to the heart, which means they were overcome with anguish, grief, and suffering. Have you ever been in a position where someone uh, was telling you not to do something, you were going to start making a decision, and they're like, here, let me offer you a little bit of advice. I've been here. Let's not do that. It might sound familiar to some of you who've talked to me over the years. Don't do that. Don't, you know. And then you do it anyways, and you, you feel just that much more shame when they go, told you, should have listened, Right? Shame sometimes is is a motivator, and it doesn't feel good. We feel embarrassed, right, in that moment when we find out that perhaps we should have we should have listened all along. Maybe maybe we should have listened to that message that Jesus was the Son of God. Maybe we shouldn't have murdered him. That was part of God's plan, though. We feel embarrassed. We feel small. We feel shame, and that is what Peter's message brought in truth. That's a, that's a big thing there. We don't shame people just, just to shame them or because we're right. You bring it in loving truth, and that's how it makes them feel. And the result is in verse 37. They feel this shame, and they are cut to the heart, and they ask a very important question. Brothers, what shall we do? All right. They feel this shame, and they are motivated to get rid of it. They're motivated to get it off of them. They don't want to be a part of this anymore. I don't want to be associated with that. Doesn't that shame make you feel that sometimes? All the time. Should. And after, uh, but they couldn't get rid of it themselves. There we go. After what they had done, murdering the Son of God, could they really think that they could get rid of their shame? This response brings us to our next two points is that we are not made to hold on to our shame forever. All right? It's our natural response when we feel shame uh, to look for a way out of it, to try to run and to hide, to cover ourselves, put that big old brown plastic, or uh, plastic, no, that brown paper bag over our heads. Let's not put plastic bags over your heads, okay? (laughs) All the kids in the back. All right. At least you guys are listening, right? We wish we could go back to before our shame. You ever felt that way? Man, if I could just go and take it back. Oh, I would. See, we can't. And it's because shame was never part of our original nature. That's why it affects us in such a way. And that's what these guilty men want. They want to be redeemed back to their former glory. We want to go back to before we committed this egregious act, this egregious sin, and they ask, what shall we do to be restored to our former glory? And are we going to have a chance to do that? And Peter says, yes, yes, you're not meant to hold on to this shame forever. In fact, God has a way for you to let go of your shame. And he tells them, what he tells them is going to change everything for the course of mankind. He's going to give them hope in a, and a solution of how to get rid of how to rid themselves of their shame. And that message is the same for you and me today. In Acts 2, 38 through 40, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore, himself, or bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Think about this, if you would. These people, by saying, What shall we do, just took on all the guilt of 
basically the illegal trial and murder and crucifixion of the Son of God. How much shame do you think they were feeling in that? Probably a lot more than a lot of you have felt for some of the things you think are big things. And they, God has offered them uh, a way to be redeemed to him and a promise that he'll redeem their children and their children's children. Do you think they were expecting that response? I mean, up till this point, what, it's like an eye, eye for an eye? We got we to gotta kill red heifers. We got to offer grain offerings. We got to do this. We got to do that. You got, you're telling me this is what I, what I got to do and I get to give my shame away? That's amazing stuff and probably, again, a response they weren't expecting. And if that's the message to the murderers of God's son, how much more should you and I believe that God doesn't want us to hold on to our shame? If he offers them forgiveness, how much more is he willing to forgive you? See, he loves us all and he's willing to forgive us all the same. And that's why it's called the good news, because the message is of how to be redeemed to God after sin no matter how egregious your sin is. And again, that's the plan. God so loved the world, he gave his son and planned to always give his son for us until he returns. His plan through Jesus' sacrifice and those uh, uh, comes through those who hear his message, they believe it, and they feel shame, which is the motivator to repentance. Repentance of what? Of their sins, and they turn to God. And they give up their shame when they're lowered into the waters of baptism and they come up as a new creature. Shame no more. Isn't that amazing what God has done for you and me? No, no yeses? All right. The shameful thing, the shameful creature now becomes a new creature, spotless and blameless until they sin again. But the good news is the sacrifice remains. And so as long as you are doing your part and you're trying to be more holy and you're not sinning, uh, uh, expecting grace, as Paul would say it, you know, so that grace may abound, there's going to be blood. There's going to be sacrifice for you. We're not, we're not expected to hold on to our shame. God has a plan for us to put it onto Jesus. You see, shame with condemnations and shame without hope turns a heart hard and calloused. But shame with a light at the end of the tunnel, shame with hope, is really good news. I truly believe that. Which leads us to our fourth point, is that shame with hope turns the unbeliever to God for redemption and the believer to God for restoration. Either way, the result is the same. The gift is the same for each of those people. Those who are in shame, turn to God, uh, who don't believe, will turn to God and they'll come to understand and realize there's a way back to Him, to be redeemed to that person I wanted to be before. All right? God can do that for me. And if we trust in Jesus and what He, has, uh, what he was sent for us to, uh, to do for us, God restores us to Himself through Jesus Christ. And for the unbeliever, they receive the redemption that they were Uh, that they were seeking after feeling shame. And for the believer, they know and have felt redemption before. And now we seek God for restoration because we know and we understand that when we sin, we separate ourselves from God. We feel that shame, it leads us to repentance. It's a cycle. None of us are going to be perfect. I I hate to tell you, even me. I, I was stressing all week, trying to make sure everything was perfect, you know? It's just, it's just not going to happen. But if we were perfect, would we need Jesus? We wouldn't. And this leads us to our final point, point. When we choose to give Jesus our shame, we get this new feeling, and it's called grace. And again, grace is like shame. It's this noun. It's a thing. It's something you receive. But you also feel it. All right? The feeling that comes when we realize that we can and will receive forgiveness when we don't deserve it. What did that look like for the Jews that had murdered Jesus? Well, those who received the word were baptized. They devoted themselves to prayers, teaching, fellowship, being in one another's homes. Meaning that when they gave their shame to Jesus, they were able to go on living life in a joyful manner. They didn't have to hold on to it. 
They could continue life. Have you ever been so shameful, uh, ashamed, I guess, that you've just wanted to lock yourself in your room or when you talk to somebody? I don't know. I had two little sisters and an older brother. So anytime they'd come by, if I was ashamed or something, I'd push them out of my room, be mean, say things that I definitely didn't want mom and dad to hear. And then they'd go, I'm going to go tell mom and dad. I'd be like, no. Nobody's ever done that, right? All right. Those who received the word were uh, a meaning, sorry, lost my spot. I think we miss a lot of times that we're, that we're supposed to live in a joyful manner. Our sins are forgiven. Our shame is taken away. And we get caught up in this section of, of the scriptures uh, trying to prove baptism and trying to prove that we need to have these small groups or whatever it is that we need. And we forget that the scripture doesn't say that they came together to remember all the ways that they wrongfully accused Jesus. Right? They came together to remember all their sins and to plead with the Father for forgiveness. You know, they wrote them down. No, it shows the opposite. They came together and they worshipped. Of course they repented, but they got to live their lives in a joyful manner because they weren't carrying this, oops, carrying this weight anymore. If you only hear one thing tonight, I hope it's this. If you give your shame to Jesus and ask God for forgiveness... You can live your life like you've been forgiven, like your shame has been taken away, because it has. We have too many Christians, I think, refusing to live joyous lives, and it's self-inflicted because they, they live life holding uh, regret of their sins and, and shame, and they don't really believe by holding on that God has forgiven them these things. That makes, really, that makes people who have a great opportunity uh, to be strong and leaders in the church, and that will, that will turn them into recluses because they don't act like they've been forgiven. We have to really, truly love it and live it. So as we conclude this evening, I want to ask you one question. What are you doing with your shame? We all have it. We all carry it. Young to old, it's going to be different as we come to know right and wrong better. My, uh, my, my six-year-old, my five-year-old, and my 20-month-old, they're not going to know shame the way that you're going to know it. You're not going to know shame the way that your youth ministers know it. And our youth ministers aren't going to know it the way that the older people know it. That's why the body comes together. That's why we're not separate, so we can learn from each other, right? So what are you doing with your shame? I want to tell you that I don't know you personally, but if you're holding on to your shame, that is not a way to live life. That's going to, uh, that's going to be a, a miserable existence. I can promise you that. And if you don't feel any shame, then you are numb and you have a hard heart. And that's not the same as giving it to Christ. And so I want to ask you again tonight, what are you doing with your shame? I pray that you're going to give it to God. I, I pray that you're going to go to Jesus with it. And I pray that he's going to lift that burden off of you and, and you get to live life in the fullness that God has expected it to be. And every time you feel this way, you run back to the Father because he's waiting for you. and He's waiting to take it from you. So give it to Jesus. Let God cover you in grace so that you can show others through your life just how great it is to serve an almighty God. Amen? If you need to respond to this message tonight, the time is now. If you need the prayers of the church, confession, restoration, perhaps you want to be redeemed to God through baptism, um, whatever it is that you'd like to do. There's a big crowd in here tonight. If you're nervous, don't, don't come forward. Grab somebody. Grab your youth minister. Talk to your parents at home. But don't go around holding on to this burden. All right? You weren't meant to hold on to it. All right? So give it to Jesus. And please stand as we uh, sing.